Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 412th episode of Constructed Chrism. I am your host, Mason, joined by my calamari loving co host, Abe. Abe, how you doing? How do you know I like calamari? We've never had calamari together. I can just tell you're a calamari guy. I'll tell you how I knew because I sent you an octopus leg and an hot dog bun, and your response was just like, could it be anything? I mean, that, hold on. First of all, calamari is squid and not yeah. octopus. I'm aware. And secondly, I'm still not sure how I feel about that picture. Yeah, maybe you were just distracted and I sent you earlier and gave me the uh huh, yeah. But I felt like in your heart, you're just a calamari man. Calamari is good too, you know? I just I think you have good taste. And as such, you would like calamari. I do have good taste. That's true. That's true. Flattery will get you everywhere in life, just like it will with this episode of Constructed Prism. Spencer is out this week. He has a hectic life going on right now. So we're tackling modern while he's away from the podcast. We know they all love modern. And when we get control of the reins, we get the people what they want. So during a modern power rankings, we're going to go over all the results from DreamHack till now. We've got two challenges, an NRG, DreamHack, a lot going on. But first, we do need to be doing always improving as it is the main point of the show. Abe, you're up first. What's your always improving moment? This week, actually over the weekend, I was working on the brand new, uh, I mean, not really that brand new. It's the Pioneer format before they printed Express Federation into it. Pioneer format, you know, there's a lot of room to kind of fill gaps and, and try out new archetypes. And I have really been working on a project of the Five Color Human Shell in the format with uh, a friend of mine, Evan. And specifically built around this interaction that I heard about listening to Dominaria's Judgment about Modern, where they were talking about a human second modern, which was using Pyre of Heroes to, like, go get extraction specialists, and it kind of let them loop Thalia's lieutenants or get back redundant Thalia's and stuff, and it was this big value engine. I was like, this, even though you don't have the same shell of the disruptive humans in Pioneer, does have the core of it for the value of, like, Thalia's lieutenant plus uh, Charming Prince and uh, extraction specialist to make sure you can rebuild out of nowhere and really... The thesis of this was all that this would be a good plan to beat the red-black mid-range deck that had been all over Magic Online before the banning and before the metagame was kind of resettled more towards mono green. And we actually, me and uh, you know, friend Evan, we played the like some MTG melee pioneer tournament that was happening, a little five hundred dollar event. We like threw this list together and worked on it all week, and it did absolutely beat the tar out of red black. And it was just really cool to see this idea, like, move between formats, trying different things out. And it's been a really, really uh, enlightening process of, of working on a deck, not only by myself in kind of a brewer space, but working with other people again on these kinds of brews. I always feel like I learn a ton about constructing different plans, making sure we're approaching the right matchups, using the right tools for things, and also a ton about Pioneer in the kinds of things that work and don't work against uh, the various fairy decks and stuff, so... That's been my week. That's awesome. That deck sounds really cool, too. I feel like the only thing that you're like also super missing is the Phantasmal image availability from the Humans one, but it's not like a huge deal, I think. Yeah, That's I think though. the biggest issue actually that I felt was lacking in Champion of the Parish, because for you to play sure. a lot of the Humans you want to play, Experiment 1 is like your best one drop, but for your mana to work and for you to play the Humans you want to play, there's not really many things with three power, because you don't really want to play Mana Strider if you're going to also be leaning on the man and pioneer not being that good and so there's a bunch of different things you want to cast it's hard to get it up to three counters you don't really have a lot of blistering pressure and you're you want to play like three inspectors and stuff to have material lying around so it's still a bit of a bit of a work in progress but it was definitely really promising to have an idea have a deck we were targeting with a plan that felt like it changed the way things were for the normal build of the deck to improve matchup and have it actually work it was it was fantastic is that list in the uh, Discord? It will be by the time this episode is up, for sure. Well, I, I hope it's in there when we're done recording, so I have something to do tonight. But that's sick. That deck sounds really awesome. I remember playing humans and just thinking, why would I play this over Winota? And the answer was, there wasn't a reason. And I just totally forgot about the humans deck during the rush last week. I think most people did. So that, that was a smart uh, smart innovation, I had to say, without having to see yeah. it all. So. Yeah, definitely, definitely thinking about what Kellen said about attacking certain things in last week's episode attacking certain things you're observing going on and also looking for places where there's already powerful decks and kind of 
picking from those was really uh really something great to put into practice. And definitely without Winota there, there's room to play a creature deck that doesn't just spin the wheel and drop some brutal stars into play or a Toll Bars on Master or whatever. Yeah, actually kind of play a bit. Just spaghettios. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, dropped my hand. So how about you, Mason? What was your always prudent moment this week? Uh, my always moment this week was re- working on figuring out how to best translate the knowledge I have about four color and the bite-sized bits that are basically, for lack of a better term, clickbait information because a lot of it's really nuanced or whatever. Not super informative to give the people a lot of the nuanced stuff in the quick sections. And so it's much more like, okay, you're going to rapid fire, give them a bunch of like 85% of the time this is going to work type stuff. And then like let them tell them like, hey, there's nuance to this. But like, you know, like if you default to this, you're going to do well most of the time versus like going over two or three things in de- in detail. So I focused on doing that um, and trying to get that down. And it's kind of interesting because what happened is, is it sparks a lot of like people are picking up modern or picking up four color who traditionally in modern don't play decks like this or they haven't played much modern. Like there's a, you know, a whole new wave of people from arena, right? Who are excited to play in paper and their oldest format experience is like pioneerish or explorer, you know, depending on how you want to look at it. And the money pile deck is just like, whoa, like there's a lot of things going on. There's a lot of weird interactions. There's a lot of things you have to learn and kind of know. And so trying to break down what the key points in each matchup are, kind of the key like tips and tricks has been a uh, interesting challenge. And it's also hard to make sure that I am not bogging people down. I can work on adding to the thing as time goes on. But to get out in time for Lansing, I needed to uh, kind of turbocharge, head down, take care of everything as quickly as I can. So that that was my always bring moment was trying to get those things as condensed and bite sized as possible and uh, as clear as well. So, you know, people do understand it. How did your 95 do? In- the same 95 that won DreamHack spoilers episode one Lansing. It is back to back. My deck list has uh, the d- double champ, which is exciting. You know, I'm a big money pile fan. I have been for months and months and months, and it's cool to see the deck kind of take over. And I, I do wonder how much I saw so much less elementals this weekend than I expected to see. And I do kind of wonder if things like I, I guess on arena deck list last week, and I got to talk to Jerry. So if you want to hear a lot about money pile in depth, Jerry and I talked about it for like 35, 40 minutes of the episode. So you can go check that out as well. I'm sure we'll cover it more here too. Pure Money Pile to Sphinx's Rev and Elementals to Abzan Midrange. And I keep trying to hammer home that Abzan, or the, the Elementals deck where Abzan is like the deck to be to beat the Money Pile deck. But you lose against a lot of other decks. I mean, this kind of happened over and over again where there's this weird cycle. It's like people skipped. The playing elemental section and like okay let's play mirrors and just game for the mirrors so like zach allen someone who i would think traditionally would not want to play the mirrors was just like whatever this is the best deck it's a control deck i love control decks i'm going to play second l Dharma's call main i'm going to play ember cool main metagame this way instead of like losing everyone else and i think that unfortunately we, we've reached the nuclear arms race section where zach's right and you can't do stuff like just dress down like i was doing because the deck's succeeding so much and people are just buying into it now because there's a feeling that, like, with Ren 6 coming out, there won't be a ban of anything for six months. So you have time to queue for the Pro Tour, uh, queue for the RCQ, playing this deck, and potentially the Pro Tour. So I think we've hit the nuclear sirens are going off. We're going to start getting more and more degenerate at each other, which is great for people like you playing Hammer Time. But I- I'm glad to not be RCQing now. I'll say it like that. I don't want to be in this arms race of, like, how many pseudo Ember cools and ways can we get ahead without having to really get without play those cards, you know? Yeah, it's so. funny. You you say that about uh about Zach Allen playing like not actually engaging in what he normally seems to do, which is find a way around a mirror match. Uh that's kind of a play style he's usually gone in. But I think that by rather than adopting like, oh, I'll play elementals and this will be the way that I'm gonna outmuscle the mirror match, he was just like, I don't know, man, I'm gonna Eldarmory's call for my Ember Cool in game one instead of sideboarding it in. And that's going to be my plan out, muscle you. Yeah, so it's really interesting to see that we've already kind of reached that stage. And as we'll see when we get to our main topic today, all of the four color decks, they are everywhere. So it makes a lot of sense to be worried about kind of these inevitability things. Uh, I do also want to say for the listeners who do want to listen to more of Mason talking about uh, about four color, not only can you go and listen to the Arena Deck List podcast where Mason did a great job, awesome episode. I loved it. I One of my favorite podcast episodes I listened to this year. Just because I love Mason. and also It's also his first episode. 
Yeah, and as a reminder, uh, if people want to hear more about Mason, hear more from Mason about playing Money Pile and talking about the deck, not only can you go listen to that Arena Decklist episode, which was awesome, uh, Spencer and Mason are going to be putting a video out coming up soon on the YouTube channel about the four color deck together, kind of in the similar vein to the the one that I did on Hammer Time with Spencer. Uh, and that should be a really great watch. Really, really informative. I know that uh, that video for Hammer Time for me, I still get people telling me that it's a lot of what they use to learn the basics of playing pretty strong and pretty difficult modern deck. And uh, if you are looking to get more information, more content, especially for Mason, who's obviously extremely efficient with the deck. It's exciting. It's essentially a free coaching session, much like Abe's was. So uh, make sure to do that, you know? All righty then. Well, let's, let's hop into the meat and potatoes. So we're doing the power ranking episodes. And Abe, you went and pulled all the numbers together. Do you want to break down real quick what the numbers mean and how we kind of got to those? And then we're going to kind of tackle modern here for a little bit and just talk all things modern since RCQs are going to be pioneer in modern. Coming up for the most part for people, you know, standard's not really around, unfortunately, these days, despite being really fun. So we're going to cover Pioneer here in a couple weeks for y'all to make sure that you're ready. But with the bannings, it just wouldn't be in good faith for us to go over Pioneer this week, because I think despite having a lot of good results right now, they're all week one results. And we'd love to have at least a second week of results before we talk about something like that. And then you buy a deck and, you know, that thing. So, Abe, what do these numbers mean? Can you tell me what the numbers are about? The way we break it down, we looked at uh, the last four major events that we really had to get on, which was the DreamHack, the NRG 10K in Lansing, Michigan, the Modern Showcase on MTGO that happened on Saturday, and the Modern Challenge happened on Sunday. You'll be familiar with this if you listen to the podcast before, but each deck gets assigned points based on its finishes in these events in the top 32. If you're in first place, you get six points, second place, five points, top four, four points, top eight, three points, top 16, two points. And top 32, one point, and we kind of went over all the decks that met at least 10 points without really high finish, uh, decks that were really notable, and, and laid them out and scored them. That's what we're working with as far as the overall format, and we, we also have in front of us to talk about uh, some of the other decks that still made placements, maybe overperformed, maybe underperformed, uh, based on what, what we're looking at in those results. But Mason, why don't you break down from the top down? Yeah, so typically, if you've listened to these episodes in the past, we like to work our way up to crescendo with the number one deck. But unfortunately, I think Money Pot, when I quickly look at it, is the same number of all the other decks combined. Or maybe it's just the top three decks combined. Money Pot came in with 71 points. So it won the two paper tournaments, one by me at DreamHack Dallas uh, over where we go now, and the other in Energy, Lansing, Michigan, where the same 95 won. Um, we also saw in NRG Lansing that three of the top four was Money Pile. And to varying things, you know, we had uh, a friend of the show, Jesse and Zach, both on there, like we mentioned, with varying degrees of metagaming and stuff like that. I believe there was also another Money Pile player in the top eight uh, of that event. So Money Pile all over the place. And that's without looking at the challenges where there were, you know, some Elementals players, a couple four color decks, a lot of different Money Pile places. But Money Pile came in with 71 points. This is a dominant performance. Now, we are looking at four events, and typically for these sort of shows, it's two to three, depending on, you know, moto challenges and stuff. But Abe, in my time on CC and listening to CC, which adds another six months to it, I believe this is the best performance since Green White Tokens, which was, you know, historically the best, like the only standard deck you could play during its time was Green White Tokens. You know, for those who didn't play, like Gideon Allies in the card and stuff. This is alarm bells going off for me because... On Moto and stuff, I always feel like it's so easy to see that, like the best decks get played in metagame because, like, thanks to the great people at Mana Traders and Card Hoarder, you can actually, and especially this weekend, with the all-access pass for the next three weeks, it's so easy to play any deck you want and for the metagame to shift and be fluid and to counter certain decks, you know? Like, if you wanted to play Belcher, it's very easy to get Belcher. Or if you want to play this deck, it's very easy. But even in paper, people are making the huge $2,000 commitment to this deck. And while a lot of the deck is staples for decks, it's still a big commitment. And uh, I, I think it's really coming in force. Like, this is the deck to beat in Modern. Something that we kind of talked about about Modern in the past, especially when it comes to this four-color deck, is that because of its cost, because it's so prohibitive, you might not see it show up in paper. And I know I don't see it show up in paper a ton in my local metagame. But at this NRG in Lansing, it was all over the top 32. I think that's where it got most of its points. But most of that event despite being a paper event where you might think that those costs play in 
it was everywhere. And the fact that Murktide, which you know we've talked about as a best deck for months at a time uh, in this format, being a full 40 points below in performance as our second highest finishing deck uh, in the power rankings. Given four color gets a little bit fudged because there's a lot of different builds, you know, the elementals deck and the money pile deck, the scores are kind of lumped together. There's sub scores within there, there's themes within there, but that entire macro archetype of Yorion, pitch elementals, Omnath, card advantage in some way, some way to end the game, that being so powerful and so towards top of the list, and especially showing from paper, I'm not really sure what to say about it other than you can't run from it anymore. You can't hide from it anymore. I think that if you're someone playing modern, you have to be playing a deck that has a plan for four color. And uh, looking at the results from the Magic Online events, where that's definitely been the case for uh, at least a few months now of people knowing about the deck, being prepared for the deck, bringing plans for the deck, the metagame's starting to move forward. And I think you're going to see the same things show up more from Magic Online in your paper metagames that to, to try to combat that you know looking at the at the showcase there were three four color decks in the top eight despite the fact that this is the case although they didn't win ultimately um living end wound up winning one of the few good performances of living end is the amount of endurance that people are playing all these four color decks are starting to hate that out it's not a deck that people have figured out an exact solution to yet and i think that until we get there it's still you got to have a plan and you're probably going to play against it one or two times, especially if you're going to try to win the tournament. When we look at the four color deck and its absolute dominance too, it's a deck that's like hard to play, but all of the good decks in the modern are hard to play. Like Murktide's not easy, Hammer's not easy, although admittedly it has some of the easier oops, I kind of won draws, but even then like the other games are so hard compared to that it all balances out. Jun's not an easy deck. Also, I can't believe we're saying Jund in this. Living in's actually, I think, quite hard. Like, the game ones are really easy, but the game two, three, there's a lot of, like, format knowledge, knowing when to maneuver around cyborg cards and what people are playing. Shadow, like, these are all hard decks, but Yorion, the, the four-color decks just overwhelm people with so much cards and, and, like, answers and stuff. The thing that I've been trying to tell people over the last week that I think maybe I've done a bad job on CC the past of saying is that despite Yorion being an 80 card deck, when it comes to things like answering creatures, your percentage of cards that do that, especially one for one spot removal, is higher than 60 card decks. Like we have more cantrips than 60 card decks. And in part, things, things like Abundant Growth and Yorion, like refilling us, you know, we are really, really good at doing that. And so we are bigger, and people joke 80 card deck, but I'm more likely to draw the, a bolt type effect off the top than you are playing a Jun deck. So like this is all just to say that the four color deck bails you out of a lot of spots too, despite being so hard. And so I think we've kind of hit the point where like, yeah, the deck's hard and the hard games are really hard and you'll lose a lot of games because you did stuff silly. But if your opponent makes mistakes too, and they're not on top of their game, you will just drown them in cardboard. And so I think people have to figure out, like, you know, get to play fast decks or something like that, or you just have to fold your money pile matchup. You know, you, you have to figure out some way to attack the deck or just, Kind of like what Kellen said before, like, whatever, lose your bad matchups and win your good ones, you know? It's hard to talk. I mean, I've talked so much about Four Color over the last week. It's all kind of run together. Is there anything you want to say on it before we move on? I'm sure we're going to reference it with the other decks as well going forward, with it being such an overwhelming part of the metagame. What you're saying is really true. And I think that if people kind of think about it as like, oh, well, there's got to be this weakness inherently in the deck where they don't draw the right cards and things don't line up. What you said about the fact that so many of your cards are redundant with each other, despite there being so many of them, is really, really true. When I was looking at the the Goldfish results for the event, and they do a little bit of breakdown of like, what are the most played cards? What are the most played creatures, non-creatures, things like that? Money Pile plays 8 of 10 of the most played cards, or something like that. I think it's like, doesn't have Mishra's Bauble, doesn't always have Ragavan, or doesn't always have Dragon's Rage Channeler. But it has like <laughs> 6 or 7 of the most played cards... That is just kind of how it is. You know, it's playing all the best cards. It's playing all the best stuff. And it's playing in spades. So, like, the numbers line up and the card quality lines up such that when it just needs to draw a removal spell, it has a bunch of removal spells. It has a high density of them. Or when it needs to draw a threat, it's drawing a good threat. It has a high density of them. And they're all on par with everything else. There's not really a sacrifice being made there to play them. And it kind of makes the deck difficult to attack. But it's important to understand when you try to make a plan for attack. Yeah, you have to be fast and disruptive 
or be a non-typical magic deck. So doing things like Belcher, Storm, Calibrated Blast, that kind of stuff is really, really good against the Money Pile deck because we're really good at answering permanence on the battlefield. You know, we have four counter spells, a couple more post board, especially if we got Veil of Summer in certain situations. But answering the battlefield, that is where we dominate, you know? We're like, insert the best football team here. You know, we, we run this red. Uh, but there is a problem with this plan, Abe. You know, if all you have to do is play Belcher or Calibrated Blast, people would do it. But our second play deck here, the second most played deck here is Murktide. And all of those decks are like a nice PB and J after playing outside all day from your mom for Murktide. It is just a great snack. And I think this is part of the, the dilemma we're in with Modern right now, is that Murktide is not only one of the most popular decks and one of the, the better decks in Modern. I, I think personally Murktide slipped outside of the, the great decks for me and into the good decks, but it's still so popular so many people love to play it, and it's so good against so many of the things that beat four color that it's just naturally going to be part of the metagame. And I, I think this does a, a really good job of just clearing the way for four color because I think the matchup is pretty good for them. And I think it's really hard to attack it because of this. What do you think about Murktide right now? Do you like the, the addition of Ledger Shredder as well? I'm so biased on this take that I, I can't speak in good faith to it. I actually haven't had a chance to talk about Ledger Shredder and the Murktide deck, but I think that Ledger Shredder is currently benefiting from a little bit of top level... For, for a while, right, it was um, Murktide's the best deck, and Four Colors the best deck, and Living End is the best deck. Like, these three are the top of the format. And as things have kind of pushed towards more and more trying to beat uh, Murktide and beat uh, Living End in all of these decks, they're kind of pushing out the necessity, or, or pushing out the ability to play a bunch of big delve spells and be focused on the graveyard. And Ledger Shredder has allowed the Murktide deck to be a little more mid range and a little less reliant on the graveyard. It has more options, um, even though it loses out on what is probably the best single threat in the format right now, being able to dodge Delirium on Holy Heats and Prismatic Endings and March of Otherworldly Lights, really requiring very specific answers uh, in Murktide region. You know, because you can't really devote big swaths of your sideboard to beating a deck that is mostly just counterspell and cheap threats. Like, there's not a card that exists in Magic that's good at beating Counterspell and Cheap Threats uniquely like that. But by shutting off Murktide Regent, you can kind of control the rest of the game plan. So to respond to that, I think people have really gone towards Ledger Shredder, which is unique in its ability to be a blue or red cheap threat that mitigates a lot of the issues that Counterspell decks have. And uh, while I think that overall it makes Murktide's plan A a little bit worse, it's been really good at hedging against the fact that uh, the plan B's and, and the, the graveyard stuff has gotten more hated out, as we can see by the fact that, you know, like I said, when we were talking about this in the beginning, Living End had kind of a, a bummer weekend, despite winning the showcase, really came in low and underperformed what you might have expected if you were looking at things a month ago. And I think a lot of that has to do with the card Endurance. A lot of these Murktide decks that I'm looking at that are playing a bunch of Ledger Shredders now, they're playing like three Murktide regions, and some of them are playing zero copies of Dragon Race Channeler, which is probably the worst card against Endurance itself as a creature, because it has to run itself into the 3-4 reach body, and it doesn't really do anything to get through that. It really runs you into some really bad spots. If you've ever played that matchup or watched that matchup, you'll see it come up a lot where they'll force them to attack, cast the, the Endurance, get a really good combat out of the deal, and Endurance will also naturally just already be shutting down Murktide regions from being able to be cast in the first place, and it can become really, really taxing. So I think that Ledger Shredder right now is solving a problem that the Murktide decks have with the rise of so many copies of Endurance being in these four-color decks, and so many people looking at the graveyard with cards like Unlicensed Hearse. But I don't know that it will always be the right thing, and I think that especially if they try to like knuckle down and beat four-color, they're going to need Murktide region because they're going to need to decide how they're beating four color and usually i think that's going to be forcing them to have specifically solitude and fighting over that my biggest problem with ledger shredder is that the card murktide region is the thing that keeps them in games against money pile you know traditionally goif was a card that was hard to answer and that was like a thing done leaned on along with being a big body clock your opponents and murktide does that, that i 
I've personally felt like maybe the Ledger Shredder should be in the spot of like cards like Jace the Mind Sculptor in the sideboard, and then they come in to help with the graveyard stuff. But I do think that if you're trying to dodge that sort of thing, I do kind of like the idea of moving away from DRC. If you're really like, hey, I don't want to get got by Endurance, DRC just dies to Endurance, like heads up all the time. And so kind of like that move, but I do think we reach the problem where it's like, okay, well, how many Endurance decks am I really going to play against versus, like, the equity that turn one DRC plus Bobble has, you know? Or, like, how they turn so quickly to turn the corner. And so it, it's a weird time to be a Murktai player, I think. I think looking at the things that are changing in the way that the Murktai decks are building themselves on, like, a small level shows that there's a lot of people trying to figure out what the way to go forward is. I think they're close to finding it. I think that Dragon Ray Channeler is your biggest liability against four color because of run and six because of endurance and because of their cheap removal and it doesn't have the same upside as a card like ragavan when i changed up my hammer list to be mindful of the run and six rise and of four color making sure i had a plan to be good against it you know the things that i turned to were i can't play mem knight in my deck because it's just too easy to get traded with and i don't care about the mana efficiency as much so but i need my ornithopters to still need the zeros can't be pinged by run and six has flying, puts more hurdles in front of my opponent. I think that Murktide is the creature that puts the most hurdles in front of the opponent to answer it. And a big part of that, of beating Money Pile, is punishing them for not. Because while they have all of the answers they need, they have a ton of different pieces of removal they can have, and they have a lot of it, they need to find the exact right one out of their 80 cards to beat a card like Murktide region. And so being very specific in your answers and playing the right threats for them is going to be key. And I think that Dragon's Range Channeler starting to phase out, more counter magic starting to come into some of these lists is showing that change, but it'll be a matter of time to see how that winds up being as, as a plan to, to move forward. Counterspell plus Merc Tide is a strong lineup for any matchup that's bad. I'll say this, I expect to see a lot of Merc Tide. I won my RCQ this weekend tweets. I think Four Colors is the best deck to be playing right now. I made that pretty clear in a lot of spots, but still, like, you know, a solid deck into the gen of the format. Um, and, you know, you can tailor it in a lot of very unique in ways. You know, and we aren't, we aren't even seeing them do things like play large amount of dress downs on the side. You could do three to four dress downs in your 75, and you would go a far, far away in modern. And old matchups that were hard, like Hammer, which we see rising up, we're about to talk about, get a lot easier when you have a lot of dress downs to access to. Hammer came in with 27 points this week. Abe, I'm not going to take any time away from you talking about Hammer. What do you think about it? And then uh, I'll hop in. It's dark days out there, Hammer players. I'm telling you. The four-color matchup, still very bad. I do agree right now, if you're playing an event where you know you're going to play against four-color, you're looking at the aggregate metagame, this is what you expect. The blue lists with a bunch of Lavinias and more copies of Spell Pierce, uh, more copies of Blacksmith Skill especially, I think, are really good right now because you're really trying to just fight over and protect things like Lavinia that put the game in your court to make the game about what you're doing. I'm still not a fan of cards like Mana Lake, but I think that slowly the blue white hammer decks are getting a little bit, a little bit smarter, a little bit better built. And you know, the deck is still so powerful and has so much upside on it that it's definitely in a spot where it can win, but you have to be targeting your, your 75 to be able to have like no leaks against four color in the post board games if you're going to want to win an event because your game ones are very very good and it only usually gets worse in the cyber game so people playing a lot of hushbringers a lot of lavinias if your plan has to be to bring in a lot of cards to beat four color it's got to be what it is because what you're really going to play hammer for is your ability to beat the decks that are trying to aim to beat uh, a four color by having raw speed and pressure and your plan for beating Murktide is going to be the fact that you are the only deck in the format that naturally lines up well against Murktide despite not going over the top of them. The only deck that really goes under them. Those are really my thoughts on Hammer right now. I think, you know, it, it still does well because the deck is so powerful and so good. It's kind of like Affinity will have those we would have those weekends, you know, years ago where it just is a good proactive deck. It it has those draws that are really hard to beat. And people are now, more than ever, cutting back some of that removal, shaving back on, on some of those things that are 
make those game ones tough where you kind of have to go for it and hope they don't have it, they're going to have it a little bit less as time moves forward, I think, and people start to focus more on winning four color mirrors or beating four color in general. That's going to be effort they're not putting into beating you, but right now it's rough. I don't know what else to say other than make sure you're targeting four color with the way you're building your deck. You have to be good against against their good spells and their interactive pieces to have a chance. I agree. And just make sure you're not giving up too too much speed and consistency and this good doing that. Because if you do, you're just gonna lose all the other matchups. And even though the color's great and it's you know, in the winners metagame, top eights, whatever, it always over was recently overperforming, probably aggregate to most decks. It is still sitting at the beating it to you know, get to get to that spot in the first place. Uh because there are people like our next batch of people playing Jund at 15 points who are out there looking to eat you and Merktide players alive and just don't have a chance against four color control. Jund, I think, is one of the easiest matchups for four color in all of modern. It is a fair deck that tries to grind cards and pressure your life total slowly, even with things like the Saga, and the four color is very good against that. So this deck, if you're playing this, you really want to be playing against like Hammer, Murktide, etc. And we saw Soul Maka get second place at DreamHack Dallas with this. The Rock himself, target player, uh, coming back out you know, from the woodwork doing that. And then we saw one in the top eight of the showcase as well, playing, I believe, very similar to Souls uh, 75. And we were seeing them adopt Jagantha as just a, you know, a thing they can pick up and play and take over. But believe it or not, I'm not a huge Jun believer, even when it comes to beating Hammer, beating Murktide Regent. What do you think about it? as a deck that's kind of like the the thing that beats the stuff people are trying to beat, you know? Yeah, I think I'm not a Jund believer so much, but I'm starting to become more and more of a discard spell believer. I'm starting to be a Thoughtseize believer because I think when the best deck is four color and they're so redundant on their types of pieces, it's really about trying to play cards that can change the texture of the game you're playing. If you're going to disrupt four color and get ahead of them, you need to you need to know where they're going to stumble and what they're going to have trouble with and try to lean on that because that's the biggest weakness they have is if you can take that iteration and then they never find an Omnath or you take that Omnath or whatever their threat is and they never find a way to pull ahead on, on the cards or you take that Solitude and they never have a way to answer the board. Being able to line up discard spells and have a lot of them plus pressure is i think a, a good approach in general and it, and it covers a lot of the, the rest of the format too because you know thoughts is obviously a good magic card so a fair game plan with thoughts is i think has a lot of legs but i'm not sure that jund is the best implementation of it i think that it doesn't have so i don't know what the something is it might be just closing speed i think that the the urza saga thing means it's just saying it's going to be playing a long game and kind of eventually getting you with like the third copy of saga they play because they have run in six but that's just too slow to handle you know even if you kind of dissect the the four color player's hand they're going to be able to have yorion come down and recoup them some cards or they're gonna top deck an expressive iteration or to fairy bounce their uh, abundant growth really just find a way to pull back into things um, and given enough time they're gonna have an inevitability in the situation so while i believe in in discard spells as part of the answer I think that Jun's just not the right shell. But I think against a lot of the rest of the format, it's showing that discard spells and, and pressure, the kind of Jun game plan does work and can be an answer. And so I'm I'm really interested in the promising stuff. I agree with that. I, mean, I think we're going to talk more about discard spells deck later. So let's move on to Yawgmoth coming in tied for uh, fourth place here with Living End. But they both have 11 points. Let's focus on Yawgmoth at first here. I feel like Yawgmoth's the deck that's trying to beat things like Murktide, Hammer, Living End, etc. Kind of like Jund does as well, but doing it from a more proactive angle. And we saw, you know, Yawgmoth uh, have a pretty good weekend at DreamHack Dallas with two players in the debate with it. Yawgmoth is always doing kind of well on paper. I think a lot of that has to do with Yawgmoth being a fun deck. Like, it's legitimately really fun and really cool to play, and it's exciting. But I think even with it having, like, a pretty good Living End matchup, a pretty good Murktide matchup, pretty good Hammer matchup. It's four-color matchup. Is it good enough? And it has this problem, Abe. Uh, you're registering Young Wolf, Stranger Root Geist, Wall of Roots, and Modern. And as someone who's played a lot of Yawgmoth, loves Yawgmoth, and is, 
you know, I was the guide for Yogg Moth. I've done a lot of work on the deck. I really love playing it. It's one of my favorite decks to play in Bonner, if not my favorite. I think it's just a little too weak right now. But maybe that's just me being a, a naysayer. I'm too much from the four color sauce. No, I mean, we've seen um, Demonic Tutors. I think he won the challenge last week with Yogg Moth. So, yeah. It was kind of a question of is, is Yogg Moth back? Is this it? But uh, looking at the showcase, which does bring out, you know, it brings out everyone really at the top of top of modern right now. Tutors did place in the top 32, but the, the competition around that event was just hostile to Yogmoth. They didn't wind up making it into the top 16. They, they couldn't get those extra wins against a field that towards the top was quite a bit of four color. You know, eventually at the top, it seems like they just run out of those other decks that they eat uh, for lunch. You know, they, they run out of those decks uh, like Hammer or like Murktide where they're they're traditionally favored and they just started running into decks that they can't quite hang against as well. So that's kind of what I think happened. I think that the deck is is obviously good and good enough to play and it can win on, on given weekends, but I think that when people really are showing up with a bunch of four color, the way that things start to look in the winner's metagame isn't favorable for Yawgmoth, and we're seeing that in the numbers, because outside of those top 32 finishes, a lot of the points for Yawgmoth uh, came from Dreamhack, which was kind of an atypical metagame, but also had a little more blue-red, because it was it was two weekends ago, as opposed to being last weekend, where we've kind of seen things push forward with even more four color than before. Let's talk about the thing that's the weirdest outlier in our whole narrative. Our whole narrative is four color, four color, four color. It's the best deck, we keep talking about it. Living End does have a good four color matchup. Uh, if you look at my deck list from Dallas, I have 11 cards in my sideboard for this matchup alone. And we see Living and coming in here with 11 points. It did win the showcase, which is a great finish. Don't get us wrong. But it kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, underperformed the rest of it. You know, there's one in uh, the top eight of the NRG, none in Dream. What, what do you think about Living in? Because for my money, second best deck in Modern. If, I, if you told me I couldn't play four color, I have to try to win the tournament. I'm ready to cycle. So I've, I haven't had a chance to look over every single deck that placed in this event and in all the events. But I think that Living End is good, but it has some issues where sometimes it'll lose to its own consistency or just people are prepared for it more now. There's more sideboard cards casually showing up in people's sideboards. You know, people are just more cognizant of their need for creative energy, starting to respect Living End enough. I would not be surprised if that led to less and less of the wins that Living End was getting initially, just based off of being Living End, uh, kind of going away because the same way that they come from being a graveyard deck that's difficult to interact with, that has this powerful cascade stuff going on and all these free pitch spells, is that once people kind of know the trick and are deciding to come beat it, they're like, Living End is not what's going to win this weekend. I'm going to try to try to target it. They can. The, the tools are very easy to find. And so even though... The living end matchup versus four color is probably favored. And I think we see that with it winning, right? It does have a good matchup against a lot of the top decks. A lot of the stuff, you know, towards the middle to to bottom, the rest of the format has a much better plan against living end. So even if living end's preying on the very top, it's still not doing it so much. You can have those eleven cards, and it it is possible to just target it and feel like you have a good chance of winning the post board games. And so that plus people who, you know, everywhere else in the format know how to target it too means that I think it's starting to be dragged down by that a bit until people maybe start having to focus more on four color. The Living in deck is really, really good. If you're listening to this podcast and you are interested by that deck, I still suggest that despite, you know, I think it brings up a lot of good points where people are learning the tricks and they are adapting to it. They do have to continuously stay on top of it. And, we, you know, we, we talk a lot on the podcast about the old affinity tax, you know, and back in the day in modern, you played your stony silences and a little extra hate for affinity. And if you did that and you drew them cool, you beat affinity and, you know, you paid your taxes. Congratulations. You don't lose this round. But if you don't pay your taxes, you're not showing up with the graveyard hate and you don't draw it. You don't have enough of it to make sure you have it in time. The living in deck will kind of punk you. And uh, this deck continues to do that. And I think. As of right now, I'm still enough of a truther to recommend it. If things don't change and people are just like, hey, guess what? Living in four color, we got our guns pointed at you, don't move. 
then maybe you have to drop living in. But for now, I, I do think it's still quite good. And I think that this is one of those things where, you know, sometimes you get the wrong matchups and there's a lot going on in tournaments. And like, you know, maybe some of the stronger players who are living in moved on to four color. And then that kind of, you know, takes away from it as well, where there are certain people, you know, like we see Piper Pal energies. Whenever she plays a deck, she top eights every energy she's played. So she's going to move the numbers one way or another. And we've seen her be a, a living in champion in the past. And while she wasn't Atlanta, you know, still, we can see that sort of things with other players as well. So living in, I'm a truther for now, but uh, we do have some red flags here, I think. But this last deck here, I think, is also a problem for living in. I think it's a problem for four color. This is kind of my rogue deck pick, rogue on quotes, the new rising star in modern, and the deck that if you're trying to beat four color, you're trying to beat living end, have a game against a lot of people. And I think the shadow deck is actually kind of good. And, you know, I hate to say it because uh, me and a shadow decks just haven't traditionally gotten along super well without Luris being involved. And uh, the new shadow decks have Letter Shredder, and they have a Fast Clock, and they have Thought Seize and Discard. And like you mentioned before, Jund. You're kind of a thought sees truth or discard truth or so am I. And I think the fast claw that Death Shadow brings, that Ragavan brings, that DRC brings, and the filtration that Shredder has to make sure you have the right cards and you're always kind of moving through your deck is something that I really, really like with this deck. And we've seen people even do things to try and get bigger. We're already seeing some innovations and stuff like Kaito entering the deck and you know, dress downs moving around in their spots in the deck. So I'm kind of a shadow truther. I think this deck is a... Uh, a strong contender. I don't know if it's better than Murktide, but it seems better at being the Murktide role if you expect a lot of four color. Because the discard spells are actually really good against the Money Pile deck if you can back it up with a clock. Yeah, I mean earlier you asked me kind of my opinion on Ledger Shredder in Murktide. And if there's one thing, if I could sum it up in one sentence why I'm kind of low on Ledger Shredder in Murktide, it's because Ledger Shredder is a card that does not play great with counterspell. You want to cast two spells on your turn to get the connive. You want your opponent to be casting two spells in a turn against you, and it's hard to be casting two spells in a turn when you leave up counterspell, and it's hard to get your opponent to want to cast two spells into your counterspell and have your counterspell still be good, right? If they're going to overload it, your counterspell's probably not doing its best. But discard spells play phenomenally with Ledger Shredder because not only... Do you is it easy to play Ledger Shredder and play a discard spell and immediately get your connive trigger? It's also, you know, easy to in the late game when you maybe don't need these discard spells, get two spells cast, loot away the discard spell, and still have all the upside in the early game of having the discard spells in your deck. I think there's a good natural fit for the card Ledger Shredder specifically. You know, it's not bringing back Luris levels of making this deck real, but I think that. Since oh, Ledger Shredder bringing back the strongest card ever, yeah, it's like not doing that. Oh, weird. Yeah, that's a hot take. I don't know if I can back you up on that one, but keep going. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, while it's not God's gift to magic, it's it's very good, and I think that people have talked about and wanted to find a way to put Ledger Shredder into modern in its best capacity, make Ledger Shredder like front and center, first and first and foremost in the way they're building their deck. And Grixis Death Shadow is the deck that does that the best to me. So I think that this is an archetype that's going to need some time to kind of hammer out the numbers, get the details. We saw it with the Shadow Lists previously with Laris up until they got banned, where they didn't really know everything immediately, but they knew the deck was good, and people put time into it and figured out the matchups and figured out the cards you should be playing and how to make it all work. And I think that once this deck has it all work, it will be the best thing to be trying to pick apart uh, four color because that's really what happened before with Luris was that it didn't need Luris in all the games to be four color. It just had Luris available to it and that made it quite a bit too good. But the game plan in general was good at forcing four color to have the things at the right time and taking away the things they would need initially. Right? Like you get to set up you know if you're like I'm going to thought to use you and then play this Ragavan because I know you have no other removal spells in every game they don't draw a removal spell you're very far ahead as Brixis if you just have that Ragavan active. I think this deck has the ability to be the real deal. I think it's just going to come down to the numbers and seeing it in second place in the showcase where, you know, the best players on Magic Online are putting their time into figuring out what to play. I think the more that people try to do this to try to find a new avenue to beat four color, the better this deck is going to get over time. And I'm really interested. It's like the biggest development to come since the last time we came and talked about modern is the ability for 
the Grixis shell to compete again, mostly because of the addition of Ledger Shredder. Let's talk a little bit about underperformers, decks that people really like that did not show up. Rhinos. Crazy. Who would think that the Rhinos deck, clunky and not really good and trying to be kind of a bad version of a lot of other decks, wouldn't show up? I don't know what happened to Rhinos. Usually so strong. Usually usually out there winning with the other Cascade decks. But it does make sense that when Living End, which you know we kind of think is the better of the of the two Cascade decks, is having a rough time out there that Rhinos is also struggling. I think it just kind of makes sense, but I didn't expect it to be that low because I know people love playing it, and I know a lot of good players that do play it kind of religiously. That, uh, but but it didn't show up. I think maybe maybe that's because the people who would normally play it and be you know I think there's a lot of room for Rhinos to have skill impacted, like you were saying with Piper and Living End. I think that when the good Rhinos players come out and play Rhinos, it has a lot better of a weekend and people are just not doing that. So, not going to say the deck's dead, you know, it's obviously not. Uh, no decks are ever dead in Modern, but it did not really show up at all. I think it had like three points. Really not looking good for the Crash and footballs. Did you want to talk about Tron? Was that the other deck you said you wanted to mention? There was one deck that I think, it had two really strong finishes in one event. It had, uh, had two top eight uh, Tron decks in the Sunday challenge, which I think is showing, you know, more of that response, the four color of trying to just pick a deck that is going over the top and locking that. One of them was the, was the prison Tron deck you said you'd written about. It was pretty cool to see, but, but Tron was showing up. Tron peppered within, within the results a bit down in there, still out there showing up. And I think that that's another place where if you're look if you're looking for a deck that maybe you're familiar with, maybe your own, you know someone who owns it, and you're worried about four color, that is a deck that you can put a little bit of time into, pick up, and maybe have a better matchup against four color than what you're currently playing if you're if you're worried about it. It's worth looking at. But I will say Tron still I don't think it's it's gonna be up there with Merktide with Hammer on, on the list of decks that I would really be interested in playing. They're gonna put up a lot of points. But I do think that Tron is a deck that you can win an event with in the coming weeks, for sure. Uh, and especially if you expect four color, I think I think Tron is not a bad choice. So I just wanted to highlight that, despite it being pretty low in the numbers, it was out there, and, and I'm I'm feeling a little hopeful for it. Okay, yeah, get in before four color players start playing our city and Chal Mars again, and then we start. Yeah, until Spreading Seas come, comes back, you are gold. Well, that's going to do it for the main topic. Abe, is there anything you want to say about modern before we wrap up here? I guess we should give our very obvious uh, suggestions for what people should play. Uh, mine being four color, but I, I don't have anything else to say about modern. I feel modern out after the last little bit. And so there's plenty. If you want to hear me talk about modern, you find it on the internet. It's out there. <laughs> you know, I think that despite what we're saying, and I think what a lot of people are saying about the four color deck, that it is going to be important for as long as this four color deck is the best deck and until something changes massively in the format, to, if you want to succeed, pay attention to the little details, pay attention when they're playing Elementals as, the, as their version, instead of playing Eternal Witness, Ephemerate, Counterspell Loop as their endgame. Pay attention when they're playing Scapeshift to try to get each other. Pay attention to the small details of what kinds of four-color decks you're playing against, and try to target those if you're someone who's not going to play them. There's a lot of opportunity to still succeed, even if you're not playing this deck. I think it's not a totally unbeatable deck in every situation. You know, there are going to be metagames where you can target it and play something, but it is definitely something you're going to have to be cognizant of moving forward and have a plan against this. It doesn't seem like it's going anywhere, and when it does, it'll be a big shakeup. Bring a plan, be prepared, and if you want to beat it, pay attention to it. Know it. So, uh, you know, when there are things like the all-access event on Magic Online, if you're someone who plays Magic Online, maybe go out there and play a couple leagues with it. See the times where you're like, how did I, like, this is exactly how I'd lose this game if my opponent knew that my hand didn't have a Solitude or a Fury, or if my opponent had just not let this spell resolve, so that you can know to not do those things. Get to know the deck on a more intricate level, because it's gonna be... That's gonna do for our main topic. If you want to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash ccmtg, get access to the Discord. All those sort of deck lists, you get to see, like, the Pirate Heroes deck, you get to see the, you know, the Money Pile deck list from me, everything in between. You also get to ask questions on the show, like this week's one from Gambit the Queen. Uh, she asks, how much difference is there in preparing decks 
slash sideboards for team events to a regular event. And uh, I love this question because I think that, you know, sometimes there's a lot of like obfuscuity and like, well, like, what are people maximizing for? What's going on with the tournament? Blah, blah, blah. But I think for team tournaments, generally people fall on two extremes. There's the people who have two of their spikiest friends. They want to win a tournament together as best they can. Or you have you and your two friends and you're here to have fun this weekend. And so people min max one, one extreme or the other. And typically to win the tournament, you're going to run to the people that are maximizing for winning the tournament. You know, typically three strong players losing two out of three rounds each is really, really hard. So for me personally, I look towards the better decks and I look to make sure that I have really strong games against things like, you know, four color living end, etc. And I have less cards that cover more space, which is something I often do where maybe I'll have a card that's not as good versus the living end as it is, you know, as another card I could play, but it covers more matchups. So I play one of those instead of playing three of another card. And you'll often see that in the team environments, I just much more focus in personally on like, hey, good decks, we're going to beat those, we're focusing on those. And if we run to the team that just wants to have fun and they all brought Belcher in every format, good game, you got us, you know? I hope you all have a good tournament and have fun. So that that's my stance on it. Uh, Abe, how do you feel? Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think that it's, it feels like in a lot of team tournaments, I would expect to start much closer to playing against the winner's metagame than you do in your average tournament. Like back when there were there were SEGs that were like, you know, 15 round team events. And I learned this lesson the hard way after playing a team GP where I, pl- I brought a deck that lost to what was likely the perceived best deck, but good against everything else. I brought this mono green deck against red black chain whirler, which was red black chain was your hardest matchup. Very, very difficult. But it was good against a lot of the blue white decks, a lot of the uh, the other creature decks. It was it was very strong against those. And I was winning a lot of Magic Online, but come this Team Grand Prix, I played against I think ten red black decks. There was like not a round where I was not getting smushed by Goblin Chain Warrior. You know that's because those people have other people that are able to help them with preparation. The people who are going to make sure they don't make overly risky decisions and get too smart. People who who want to play it safe, I think, usually happens more in team events because you are working with it. You do care about the results of, of the people around you, and there's a lot less of the random stuff and a lot more of just the stuff that people think are good. So, you know, think accordingly. You're going to start play- by playing against decks that you're probably aware of and that other people are aware of and the good ones at that. So it does give you a lot of opportunity to do like what Kellen talked about with us last week. Gives you more opportunity to target a bunch of decks or, or a winner's metagame sooner because you're going to play more rounds against those you know really good decks earlier on instead of having to wade through kind of the early rounds where it's it's so much noise and you have your teammates there to bring you up so i think that's a really good question and i hope their answer uh, was helpful tldr metagame more you ready for the good stuff if you also want to get a question the show one way is to go on youtube.com and leave a comment on the show last week's comment is from root of pi they said the always premium section is often my favorite section of the podcast. Keep up the amazing work. Thank you so much for that comment, Rita Pie. Uh, the always improving segment, you know, I say at the beginning of every show, it's kind of the, the tagline, but it is the main point of the show. And it doesn't mean like that section exactly. It is kind of the thesis of the show, right, Abe? Like we are trying to help everyone and ourselves work on and improve all the time. We love to hear that you love it, and it's not going anywhere. That's the thing that's been here since, like, episode 10 that doesn't change. <laughs> it was the entirety of episode 400. So if you really like Always Improving, and your listener likes Always Improving, didn't go and listen to that episode, great chance. That is going to do it for this week's episode of Constructed Criticism. Make sure to check out the rest of the network. We have Drafting Archetypes with Sam Black. Uh, do you know if Sam covered Boulder's Gate? I was unsure if Sam would. I haven't had time to check, but... I'd be curious, Double Masters Boulder Gate, those are two new draft form- formats. Uh, no, I think, I think he's still working on uh, working through Nuke Penna. I know the last episode that I listened to was the episode on drafting Grixis, kind of the foil to drafting the blue-white decks that have dominated that draft format. So if you're interested in limited and getting better, definitely the podcast to check out. So make sure to check that out, and also make sure to check out Common Knowledge. It is a popper podcast focused on all things popper. So if you love that, check that out as well. Abe, if someone wants to find you, where can they go? They can find me on twitter.com slash more nothings. Uh, and my DMs are still open for Hammer Time coaching sessions. If you are 
one of the reluctant few who is still going to play Hammer Time into a field of four color after listening to this, and you are motivated to take on the enemy. You know, I will help you out, but I also, you know, will help with uh, with other formats and stuff too. DMs are open for that. Always looking to help people improve Magic Hammer Time. You can find me on Twitter at Mason E. Clark. You can find me on Card Kingdom each week writing. This last week, you can check me out on Card Kingdom if you're looking for all things four color and money pile. We touched on a bit here, kind of in granular stuff, but Jerry and I go into detail on that. So you go check out the Randex list this past week and make sure to check out twitch.tv slash the Mason Clark. I do offer coaching as well. So we never want to talk about money pile suddenly. I don't know why. It's such a weird conversation thing. I mean, who's but, even uh, one with the no, no one of importance, that's for sure. Uh, just handsome young lads uh, with gray hair. And uh, <laughs> uh, but anything coaching related for Magic, you want to check that out, feel free to DM me anywhere, Discord, Twitter, whatever. And we'll see you all next week on another episode of Constructed Crystal.